All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm the director of engineering at Uber. And um, the talks that I really enjoy seeing are kind of the ones that tell like a narrative history, kind of tell a story and an evolution of a product. And so I kind of wanted to do that about Uber. I think there's a lot of in interesting curiosity around how this even came about. And then, and then talking about how we've evolved to having a lot of internal APIs that we have. We don't have anything public in terms of an API, but we, we consume a lot of public APIs. And we also have a lot of internally developed APIs that we use that maybe someday we will make public. So just wanted to go into kind of like the history of the company, how we evolved over the past three years, and then where we're at now. And, and so uh, just to get started in the history. So it has a very unique kind of founding story. So Travis and Garrett um, are two founders. You know, they essentially just did this because they hated getting a taxi in San Francisco. Like Travis lives at the top of this hill. Taxis would never pick him up. It was crazy. Um, so <clears throat> what, what they eventually like, decided upon was like, hey, let's buy a car, let's put it in a garage, and let's hire a driver that we can just call up and say, hey, come pick us up. We'll just solve all our own problem and have our own car and our own driver and share it. So, you know, thinking, oh, this will just be great for the two of us. And, and I think Garrett was the one who even said, like, you know, I don't even want to call the driver. I just want to push a button and have him show up wherever I am. So um, they, you know, were both kind of busy. Travis was angel investing. Garrett was uh, buying StumbleUpon back from eBay. Um, they were both pretty busy and didn't really have time, so it was sort of built out as a proof of concept by these contractors uh, from Mexico City. And so, <clears throat> so they really kind of, you know, incubated the idea but weren't actively working on it for a long time. Um, and then, you know, they were using it and their friends were like, this is really cool, I want it on this too. What, how do I get access? And so that's sort of the, the origin story behind this. And so, you know, um, it, it just turned from this proof of concept to solve their problem into something that could solve a lot of other people's problems as well. So I joined almost three years ago. This is like the whole company back then. Um, there was only four engineers and we were maintaining a monstrous amount of code. We had three mobile applications. We had our blog, our website, our dispatch engine, all the different pieces of business logic. Um, you know, it was, it was a lot of things for, for the four of us to kind of like grapple with. And there was, there was probably a couple years there where I didn't sleep. Um, but I made it through that. But, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but just one thing that I think is really interesting is just talking about, you know, where we came from and then where we go. So, you know, around this time, the, the, we inherited this architecture built by these contractors, and this was it. It was a basic LAMP stack. That's how everyone built things back in, like, 2008, 2009. Um, but it's not the most optimal solution for uh, a real-time dispatch system. It's great for like, it was great for websites. I don't think people build things with LAMP stacks that much anymore, but back then it was, you know, decent for websites. But, um, and there were other problems in that because it was built by people in Mexico, all the code was in Spanish and we didn't understand any of it. <laughs> um, but I'll get into that later. And so, yeah, what I basically want to talk about is how we went from this to this, which is kind of the current state of things a bit simplified. Um, so, just, just going back to like uh, the first year. So the first year of Uber, like you know, we inherited this this very simplistic system. This this literally ran everything that we had. It was the dispatch engine. It was fare calculation. It was the promotion system. It was the website. It was the blog. All of this was running on one server, and we had no redundancy, no failover, no anything. It was pretty insane. Uh, I, I'm amazed that we. I mean, we had some outages, but I'm amazed we didn't have more. Um, <clears throat> And uh, <coughs> so we, in we inherited this architecture, and we kind of just were trying to understand it. We literally had the Spanish-English dictionary on the desk, trying to understand what was going on in all the different places here, and um, eventually figured it out, kind of monkey patching. But there was all these problems with it. So you know, <coughs> all the state of dispatch was stored in MySQL in a database. And then PHP was running on you know, Apache. And so multiple requests would come in saying, I would like a car. and because of concurrency issues that would happen there, that you could get things like double dispatches where like two cars would go to one person or, two, or one person would go to you know, two different cars and things like that. There was all these little issues that we were trying to like fix and you know, that was essentially why Travis brought me in to kind of like help re-architect the system. You know, like let's just start from scratch. This wasn't designed to be like a massive global transportation network. Let's just start from scratch and, and, and do this thing again. So. Um, I joined, and uh, literally the day I joined, Travis and I jumped in his car, drove to LA, and rented a beach house in, um, in LA for 
two weeks and just whiteboarded, prototyped, built all these different things. You know, we had a lot of experience um, from building Red Swoosh, which was a peer-to-peer -peer content delivery network, and how to build large-scale distributed systems. And we realized that, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer system which says, I'm a peer and I would like this content, generally a byte range of, of some video or something, and connecting them to another peer that has that content is very similar to connecting somebody that wants a ride with somebody that can provide a ride. It's essentially the exact same thing, but instead of bytes, it's a service. So we kind of like designed this new architecture. This was literally the picture that we drew um, back in January 2011 and said, okay, this, this, this might be how it can work better. You know, let's, let's do dispatch only does dispatching. All it does is connect that client and driver and then they negotiate everything after that. Let's pull all the business logic out into this, what we call the API, um, which is a Python layer that essentially all the business logic, user authentication, promotions, fare calculation, these sorts of things. Um, you know, kind of splitting things out from this monolithic system into things that are a little bit um, more componentized, a little bit more modular. Um, <coughs> so um, you'll notice, well, it's kind of hard to read from the screen, but there's, you know, this is chock full of buzzwords. We got Node.js, we got MongoDB, all kinds of crazy things. Um, you know, and, and, and a lot of that hasn't worked out for the long-term kind of production viability of the system. We, we hit Mongo to its limits very quickly and we actually switched all of that out of the system. There's no more Mongo in the system. It couldn't handle the write volume we were doing. Um, but for the most part, this is essentially what ran us the entire second year. So, I mean, this, the second year of Uber, we went from having four engineers to essentially having about 20 or so um, and on a variety of, of systems here. And so this, this kind of helped us scale out our team and you know, become bigger and have people working on different things. Before it was kind of this free for all where I would work on the mobile app one day and then I'd work on dispatch the next day and go back and forth. So this, this helped us scale the team a little bit and go to the next level. But, um, but then you get to the point where you keep growing and you keep growing and this API just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more bloated and people are, you know, writing over each other's code or there's conflicts and things like that. So you realize you really need to move towards a more service-oriented architecture. And so that's what brings us to current state of things. Um, you know, we have a lot of different services internally that help, that kind of like do lots of little bits of work that, that end up in the full Uber experience. Um, and so, we started going towards a service-oriented architecture, but I, I'm somewhat critical of just pure service-oriented architecture. Um, so <clears throat> just in general, I think, I think service-oriented architecture is actually a great thing. I think it helps you scale really well, but only once you have the resources to support it. Back when we were four engineers, if we actually tried to make a pure service-oriented architecture, we would have spent all our time thinking about what should this API be? How should we design it? What, what should we do with this? Instead of actually getting shit done, which is we were up all night just coding, 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 just and it was, the first year or two was very much like just hack it till it works. And uh, you know, we've since switched away from that. We have much more mature engineering processes now. But um, you know, when you're in that super early startup phase, you just don't have the time to truly design things the way they should be designed. And it's kind of a sad state of affairs, but it gets you that, that time to market that is very crucial. Um, but then once you do have the resources to support it, so for example, we started our infrastructure team probably about a year ago. So the first, again, uh, two years, we didn't have a formal infrastructure team. It was just everybody kind of like trying to figure out what was going on. Um, but once you do have the resources to support it and have a formal infrastructure team, I kind of have on the mindset that you should centralize the infrastructure so that teams don't get all crazy doing all, all different things. I know Amazon, for, for example, is a big believer in service-oriented architecture, but they also even structure the teams um, as a service-oriented architecture. So like every team maintains like their own piece, which maybe that works at the scale Amazon's at. We haven't quite gotten to that scale yet, but I'm sure we will pretty soon. Um, but it's, to me, it's like centralizing that infrastructure just makes things work much better. Um, so I'm gonna talk about one example of that that I think has worked really well for us. Um, our infrastructure team basically created this framework that we call Clay. And Clay is a Python framework. It's based on Flask. It's very, very simple. It's for building RESTful backend services. And essentially, all of those bubbles you see in the, in the huge diagram are Clay services that we've built. And um, it allows us to basically rapidly build these new APIs inside of our stack and deploy them very easily and quickly. The infrastructure team basically like 
you're like, I want to build this service. You take, you just fork clay, build your service, and then send it to the infra team, and they can deploy it, maintain it, and have monitoring all built in. So it comes with hooks for sending email, logging, HTTP requests, monitoring systems, um, like StatsD integration, all these different things. We also open sourced it so that other people could contribute. But um, this has allowed our team to basically scale to, now we have about 80 engineers. We're going to have hundreds very soon. Um, and allows them to just build what they need to build without things getting in the way and without having to have their own support teams and infrastructure teams to maintain and operate all of these things. So this has been supremely valuable in allowing us to um, you know, grow our engineering team and still maintain some sort of sanity with, uh, without having all these different languages and things flying around. So some examples of things that we've built in Clay. <clears throat> these are internal APIs. They're not exposed to the public, but maybe someday they would. Some of these could actually probably be their own you know, companies built around it, but um, so one that I think is fascinating, map fitting. If you've used the app recently, you know that the, you see the cars and they kind of drive along in real time as they're moving. That was actually a really difficult problem because GPS loads, and so we built all of these algorithms that basically kind of smooth out the points and snap to the roads. And so, and then things for like doing the acceleration of cars and so that they animate in real time. So this is just one service that's a clay service that we built. and. Um, handles the map fitting for all the cars all over the world. Um, another interesting API is the uh, ETA engine. So when you look at the app and you can see, oh, there's a car five minutes away. Um, you know, in the early days, we used Google because you know, we, we were like, we don't know how long it takes to go from here to here, but Google's driving directions do. But back then, Google, um, their, accurates er, sorry, their estimates weren't very accurate for trips like under 10 minutes, which the vast majority of our pickups are under 10 minutes. And so we just built our own ETA engine because um, you know, we, we couldn't get the accuracy that we needed to provide a great customer experience. We used a lot of our historical data, um, time of day, weather, these sorts of things. And so we essentially built our own ETA engine. And once we built Clay, we ported it to that as well so that we could you know, keep iterating very quickly. So um, dynamic pricing is a very popular one. Nice thing when you're out Friday or Saturday night and you see the screen that tells you it's going to be 50% more than usual. Um, that's also a clay service. And basically, it takes like the, the real-time utilization of the supply and demand and figures out like what should the price be based on the current supply and demand patterns that you're seeing out there. And most recently, we built an A-B testing service because we're going to start doing a lot more rigorous A-B testing of a variety of features and user behaviors and, and these sorts of things. So there's like 40 plus other like services that we've launched as internal APIs and support. Um, because of clay. So <coughs> let's see. And we have a lot of other open source stuff as well. Um, but that's pretty much it. My talk is very short. I, I, I basically just kind of want to give an insight into kind of Uber, how it um, grew from where it is to where it is now, and also um, just how I think that you have to really as their company grows, figure out what really makes sense at the time. I think one of the things that is unique about what we do is we're constantly refactoring our processes, our team structures. We're never satisfied with you know, doing things as we have been doing. I think we haven't had a single process that's lasted more than six months, because we're always changing it, learning from it, making things better. Um, and I actually just think that learning the history of these companies is fascinating. I love reading the history of all these different companies and how they came about. Because um, it's never this rosy, shiny picture of like, oh, we just thought of this idea and made it, and it was done, and now everything is awesome. It's, it's generally not the original idea that ends up being the successful one. So.